Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another talk on our presidency series. Today's topic is JFK, the New Age President. Uh, now, here we see John F. Kennedy, picture we've all seen a million times, but today we're going to explore the story behind this dashing young couple here pictured in an ordinary suburb. Now, our topic will be first the American century, the age of uh, John F. Kennedy, then John F. Kennedy the man, the characteristics that so typified the post-World War II era, followed by the ongoing and cherished JFK legacy. Now, JFK really typified an era in American history, which we call the American century. Once again, it's one of those terms that we use and recognize, but we tend to forget that it was the a headline, which was on Life magazine in February 17, 1941, which announced to the world and to the United States for the roaring sum of 10 cents that the age following World War II the defeat of the Japanese, the defeat of the Germans, and the defeat of the Italians was going to be an age unlike any that America had ever experienced. The United States had come of age, and we were launching a whole new era, which would henceforth be known as the American century. The person behind the term the American century was Henry R. Luce, who was the editor of Life magazine. And he wrote in this article uh, that throughout the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, the American continent teemed with manifold projects and magnificent purposes, and that finally they had all come together into a new civilization. And it is in this spirit that all of us, all of us Americans, are called to create the first great American century. So he's even more optimistic than launching the American century, but predicting that this American century would probably become two, three, if not four centuries. Now, all the pieces were in place for the American domination of the world. Following World War II and FDR, the North Atlantic Treaty, NATO, the UN was built, the World Bank and the IMF were in place. Organizations like the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization were built to keep a future Japan in check. Organization of American States, a new era of goodwill and harmony with Latin America. And, of course, the famous Marshall Plan, which funneled billions of dollars to the defeated countries of Europe, rebuilding them to be strong allies of this new American century. Now, immediately following the war, we had Harry S. Truman, who took over, followed by Dwight Eisenhower. But they were both members of the old guard who had been shaped by World War I, the Depression, and all of that. And it was only with the election of John F. Kennedy in January 1961 that the United States was firmly in the middle of its new era, of this new age. And in his brief presidency, January 61, to November 63, he really shaped the American presidency, shaped the United States and its American culture, and established the United States as the world superpower. Now, what distinguished JFK from all other presidents? Well, I have here several characteristics which I will talk about in turn. Nationalistic, fiercely nationalistic, inclusive, what is an American? It includes everybody. He was young. He was vivacious. He had a beautiful young wife marking the new era. But he was deeply religious, or at least religion played an important role in his life. He was eminently educated, and he came from a very prosperous family background. And these were the characteristics that would mark the short presidency of JFK and would mark, many would argue, the United States until today. 
Now he began his presidency with once again a great slogan, a slogan, the New Frontier, which rivals that of the New Deal and so many other um, sl political slogans. But in JFK's sense, uh, case, they reflected a very uh, powerful reality. And here we see his most famous sentence, we stand today on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of the 1960s, the frontier of unknown opportunities and perils, the frontier of unfilled hopes and unfilled dreams. Beyond that frontier are uncharted areas of science and space, unsolved problems of peace and war, unconquered problems of ignorance and prejudice, unanswered questions of poverty and surplus. So he shows that the new era, the American century or the new frontier, was going to be problematic. Now, even when he chose the word frontier, he's thinking back to an idea deeply rooted in American history, the expansion westward, the eternal frontier until we got to the Pacific Ocean, and then taking up this term for exploration of space, exploration of science. So he said that the new era, the age of America, was going to be was deeply rooted in American history. It was some, not some new idea, but this was fulfilling the manifest destiny, the great vision of the United States. Now, JFK was very strongly nationalistic. He was a war hero, and unlike uh, General Eisenhower and the other generals who have sat in the White House, he was not a general. He was a soldier. And here we see very um, well-reproduced pictures of him in his um, PT-109 um, as an ordinary soldier who won the war in the Pacific, was instrumental in that, defeating fascism of Japan, and later on, the Americans defeating fascism and Nazism in uh, Germany and in Italy. So he was a young man, fresh from the battlefield, covered in glory, a great hero, a young man ready to put the war behind him and launch the United States into a new era, and very much in keeping with American history, fulfilling the great destiny, the manifest destiny, that the United States was charged by God to accomplish. So it was an era of fierce nationalism. And here we see uh, John F. Kennedy and one of his many speeches were very inspiring, calling Americans to fulfill this great destiny. And so my fellow Americans, once again, a man of the people, he is a fellow American. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Probably one of his most famous uh, lines, once again calling on all Americans to be part of this great new century. And again, my fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of Man. Once again, it was not just the United States luxuriating in its wealth, but we had a global mission, a mission to bring democracy. Don't forget the Statue of Liberty does not face the United States. The true title of the Statue of Liberty is Liberty Enlightening the World. Our democracy was universal in value. It was an export item. Now, JFK was inaugurated January 20th, 1961, and barely was he in the White House than he inherited the uh, conflict with Cuba. Now, the Bay of Pigs of April 1719, shortly after his election, was not a glorious moment uh, in American history, but it is generally not considered a, a great defeat in JFK because he did not really support the militaristic approach to dealing with Cuba. So this really did not tarnish his uh, new reputation 
as launching a new era. He gained a lot of fame for his astute handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And here we see one of his large, one of his speeches where he was showing that it was the duty of the United States to resist the Soviet expansion, that this was the major challenge, that the military, offensive military equipment being shipped to Cuba was a threat to the United States, and that a quarantine, as it says, will be extended if needed to other types of cargo and carriers. So he was standing up to the Soviet Union, which by his presidency had become the major rival of the United States. That was followed by the uh, Berlin Crisis, where once again he gave his famous line, Ich bin ein Berliner, I am a Berlin citizen. And he said that, uh, that everybody in the West should be united in standing up for Western democratic values, and that these values were not only American values, but they were universal and they were exported. So here again it reaffirmed his firm and deeply held uh, American nationalism. Of course the Vietnam War was another mark on his address where he clearly stated in his inaugural address that we must pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe in order to assure the survival and success of American liberty. So once again, it was not a traditional European style takeover of another country to exploit it, even if many people accuse the United States of having that in mind, but still his lofty rhetoric was the war was necessary to protect and encourage the survival of liberty. In April 62, John Kenneth Galbraith, a great um, economist, wrote, the danger we sh will shall replace the French as a colonial force in the area and bleed as the French did. So there was a warning where Galbraith said that there was a real danger that we would become another colonial power. And we see under Kennedy's watch the 900 advisors who were in Vietnam when he took office grew to 16,000 American military personnel by 63. But once again, it showed that he was willing to stand up for American values and stand at what the United States stood for. So he was firmly and deeply nationalistic and was willing to stand up to any threat to the United States. Now, the second characteristic that really marked the JFK presidency was it, the American inclusiveness. He firmly believed that the United States had this remarkable gift to absorb immigrants. Today, when we read the newspaper, we're talk, we hear about some 800,000 immigrants or refugees being admitted into Germany plus hundreds of thousands in France and Britain, and the, the severe backlash it's creating in these countries who are not accustomed to huge numbers of immigrants. Whereas Kennedy believed that the United States was the opposite. We were a country of immigrants. The colonial period, the English, here in New York, the Dutch, and New York City, the Sephardic Jews of Sherit Israel, the first synagogue in the United States, even American slaves, African slaves were brought over and were made part of the American melting pot. During the mid-1800s, uh, two and a half million Irish Catholics, two and a half million Germans came over and were absorbed. And in the late 1800s, scores of it, millions of Italian Catholics, Eastern European Orthodox Jews, Eastern European Catholics and Orthodox Christians, plus millions of Puerto Ricans, had successfully been absorbed into American society. And especially and acutely important for the Kennedy clan, was the fact that Irish Catholics were successfully absorbed into this melting pot. 
Here on the slide in the upper left, we see this famous Thomas Nast uh, cartoon showing reptiles swimming across the Atlantic. They look like crocodiles, but they're wearing the crown of bishops and popes. And um, the good white Anglo-Saxon Protestant standing on the shore, which is being invaded by reptiles, with the Vatican in the background, this great Catholic invasion. And we see, uh, but as the Kennedy clan knew well, the United States had the power, the eternal force, to absorb millions of Irish Catholics, and one could even enter the White House. Also, there was a fierce reaction against the mass migration of Jews, either German Jews or Eastern European Jews. And, of course, anti-Semitism was present in the United States, as was anti-black racism. But, Kennedy argued, the United States had been able to deal with these issues, confront them, and absorb everyone into the giant melting pot of American culture. There's a fantastic book, which I, I always recommend, and it's Are Italians White? Talking, uh, and it highlights the census um, statistics of the late 1800s, which lumped Italians with African Americans and Hispanics and Asians as colored people. And it was a big battle to get Italians to be recognized as white people by groups like the American government and the census bureaus and things like that. And so we see how even dark-skinned Italians, so-called colored, could gradually join American society and become successful and accepted Americans. And of course, a large part of this was thanks to the American public school system, which absorbed people of every background into the mainstream. It taught new immigrants English. It taught them how to interact with people of cultures very different from your own. JFK was also a strong supporter of overcoming the last vestiges of racism in the United States, and that was absorbing the African Americans into the mainstream. In fact, it was World War II that integrated the army, not because there was any great love of African Americans by the white establishment, but simply the need for soldiers. And we see here one of his first and major civil rights speeches of June 11, 1963. And he says give, that he supported civil rights as giving all Americans the right to be served in facilities which are open to the public, which was a major step forward where the um, uh, black and white waiting rooms in bus stations and train stations, segregated uh, railroad cars, would be um, a thing of the past. And the Jim Crow laws, which kept African Americans from voting, would be overturned. And so John F. Kennedy be, uh, goes down in history as one of the great civil rights uh, presidents. And shortly after his assassination, the great Civil Rights Act, which John F. Kennedy uh, designed and wrote, was finally signed by LBJ on July 2nd, 1964, bringing the African Americans into the glorious uh, um, new American society. And a new generation was being born, according to JFK. And he wrote, he said in his inaugural address, we dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. American Revolution. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. Once again, there's this fierce optimism and faith that he had in the United States, that this new generation was born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of these human rights to which the nation has always been committed 
which we are committed today at home and around the world. Such stirring words we haven't heard in a presidential inauguration in a very long time. And this was very much the trademark of JFK. Now, in addition to his nationalism and to his belief in the brotherhood of all Americans, the third characteristic which really defined the JFK presidency was his youth. He was, after all, the youngest president in American history at the age of 44. He was of that generation, often called the greatest generation, which had been born before the war, fought in the war, and then after the war returned to America, married their uh, high school sweetheart, and set about building the American century. Now, I know this very well because I am of the baby boom generation. I was born in 49. And so this was the, my aunts, my uncles had fought in the war. They had come back and set about mass producing babies. I'm one of eight. Uh, an uncle is one, I have uncle had eight kids, another had six kids. So 77 million people of my generation were, re, were produced by the JFK generation. And Kennedy was very well aware of that. When we look at this picture here on the left, we see a young couple sitting on their back porch with two little kids building the new American generation. And on the right, we see the baby boom, the spike in population. Um, we see in 1929 and the Depression years, uh, uh, very few babies born, and then during the war, but then right at the end of the war in 1945, when my oldest brother was born, a spike in population called the famous baby boom. Now, the JFK generation, not all of them were fabulously wealthy and living in mansions. The United States had to adapt to all these newly returned military couple, military men returning, marrying their sweetheart, and moving into places like Levittown. We see this, this, this unbelievable map of Levittown here in New York, not far here in Long Island built in 47 to 51, to house all of these returning soldiers and their wives and the babies they started producing. Now this was mass-produced housing, whether it was giant housing developments in the city of New York for um, couples living in apartments, or places like Levittown, where identical houses were built mass produced. Now you can imagine after the war with so many young couples needing housing, they didn't have a lot of money to spend. So if you were a housing developer like at Levittown and you ordered 10,000 fr identical front doors, you got a good price. And so this was mass produced housing for the JFK returning soldier generation. Of course, part and parcel of the American dream was home ownership. Look at the chart, the spike in home ownership beginning um, from a very low at the end of World War II and just skyrocketing where be, uh, becoming a homeowner, even if in reality the bank owned it, but it was your home. You paid it off and it became a sign of the American success. Family values were at the core of the JFK generation. Of course, we never talked about what was going on uh, outside the, the, the family uh, relationships, but of course this was always going on and it always will. But the ideal was of family values. Here we see the famous uh, Thanksgiving uh, print. Uh, which we all recognize, and we have even an atlas of the baby boom generation charting the um, cultural history of post-war America. And of course, who's on the front page? President John F. Kennedy walking with uh, one of the little kids. I mean, I often see that picture of JFK sitting at his desk in the Oval Office with uh, one of his little children crawling around on the floor in front of him. 
a, vi a view which resonated, re uh, re uh, uh, resonated with every American. And on the lower left, we see TV shows all in the family. Father Knows Best, reinforcing the standard American family with loads of kids. Also, it was a youthful couple. For the first time, you see a president in a polo shirt on a boat going fishing, his hair blowing in the breeze. This was the young generation. They, they were active. I don't know if we've seen pictures of him working out in a gym, but this is the president who would jog, who would do sports, who was the ideal of every American post-war family. Now, the next characteristic which really marked the JFK generation and the American century was it was, a relig it was an era marked by religion. Uh, Will Herberg wrote his famous Protestant Catholic Jew in 1955, which really summarized the, uh, the, the, the ethos of the time, that it didn't make any difference whether you were Catholic, Protestant, or Jew, the fact is that you supported the same morality, the same family values. And he even said that American society was a three-legged stool. One leg was Protestant, one leg was Catholic, and one leg was Jew. And when you could look at the statistics, though, of the population, I mean, Protestants were by far the largest group in America, Catholics were the largest individual denomination, Jews were a tiny minority in this story, but Will Herberg um, made the thesis that they were the three American religions. We see the suburban churches in the middle picture and on the book where you have these ultra-modern churches. They're no more Gothic and Romanesque and Renaissance churches, but churches of the space age, churches of the suburbs, giant parking lots about them. And the famous Shul with a Pool by David Kaufman, where he argued that the swimming pool and the basketball court rivaled the synagogue sanctuary as the center of modern Judaism. So this was a religious age when it was not so much a question of uh, what religion you belonged to, but it's were you considered a member of a particular church and did you go to a church or a synagogue? Don't forget that the post-war years saw the adding of the words uh, um, in God we trust to the American currency. This was a time when one nation under God was put into the Pledge of Allegiance, showing that we were an American nation. And, of course, we see from Atlantic to the Pacific the mobility of Americans. The United States was linked together by a massive network of highways that we were all one nation. So like the railroads of the previous century, which knitted the United States into one giant family. After World War II, it was the interstate highway system, which became a physical um, um, manifestation of the unity of all Americans under one God. And we see John F. Kennedy constantly being photographed, leaving church, meeting with the Pope. And we see magazines with the, such as the Literary Di Digest, once again showing families at prayer. Uh, that uh, religion was a part of the American middle class culture. And here we see the respectable middle class values. Union membership was at its high. The middle class was profiting from American wealth and education like no society ever before. If you draw the, the graph of the American population, the middle class was by far the largest with a small 
group of wealthy at the bottom and an ever-diminishing group of impoverished people at the bottom. And so this was a golden age of middle class values. Now, of course, you'd say, well, Kennedy was not middle class, but he personified the middle class, that anybody could rise up and be successful, just as the Irish Catholics had done. Now, the next characteristic which really typifies the JFK um, uh, family and American society after World War II was it was the first generation where not only high school but college education became accessible to the masses. We all know John F. Kennedy went to private schools and then went on to Harvard and was really at the top. But don't forget, at the time when he went to Harvard, there was still a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment. And the law school at Harvard was the last school to admit minorities, such as Catholics and, uh, and African Americans. And so education was central to this American generation, the American century. Of course, the GI Bill, which so many soldiers took advantage of, educated 8 million veterans. Now, these were the children of coal miners from Pittsburgh, farmers from the Midwest, ranchers from Texas, factory textile workers from New England. These were the children who went to war in patriotism, and when they returned, the government took an active role in sending them to college. I once asked how many of my uncles had profited from the GI Bill, and the vast majority did, whether they became airline pilots or teachers or superintendents of schools. The GI Bill was a powerful impetus in raising the um, society. Now, um, uh, we see that there were not only uh, college professors, but pilots, teachers, engineers, and we see the um, college enrollment constantly increasing over the um, generations. New college campuses were being built. And they were no longer the old style campuses, as we see in the lower left, City University here in New York, or Columbia University in its Greek and Roman style of architecture. But this was education for the new age. And in the upper left and the bottom right, we see college architecture, the new age. College campuses thrown up as fast as they can to accommodate all of these young people going back to school uh, or going to college for the first time. Evening classes permitting um, people to have full-time jobs but get their college degrees at these rapidly growing universities which were growing up in every city, whether it was a community college or whether it was a major university. And John F. Kennedy believe firmly that this American value, that Americans not only had the right to gifts from the government, such as home loans and GI Bill, but he launched the Peace Corps, once again, one of the most optimistic uh, programs of his presidency, to promote world peace and friendship and to make available to countries and uh, areas men and women of the United States qualified for service abroad and willing to serve um, the world's populations. And this was once again part of his phenomenal optimism in spreading the good news of American society that had risen uh, from very modest backgrounds, absorbed people from every nation, and making them into pr productive Americans. And finally, the characteristic that also typifies that whole generation, and that John Kennedy was a great missionary of, is the post-war era, the American century was going to be marked by prosperity. The standard of living in the United States after the war just rose dramatically. D 
Detroit, which had made airplanes and tanks and trucks during the war, went back to mass-producing automobiles. The textile factories that had turned out boots and uniforms and coats started making mass-produced clothing. The kitchen revolution, electric refrigerators, toasters, coffee makers, electric frying pans, aluminum counters. During the war, there was no aluminum left for anything. It was all going into the war effort. But yet all of these brand new labor-saving devices and this new era was being spread by this new invention of the television, which, once again, the war industries went from producing guns and, and um, machines for war to creating televisions, which got smaller and cheaper and brought the American dream, the message of the new century, into everybody's homes. No matter where you lived, even in the most remote areas of the Midwest, you knew what was happening in New York. You knew what to buy. Advertising was all powerful. Television shows, the Andy Griffith Show, Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver, Ozzy and Harriet, My Three Sons, even the Flintstones trumpeted the wealth of the new era. Everybody had a car. Everybody had a nice house. Nobody was getting a divorce. Yes, and Father Knows Best, we see three children, Ozzy and Harriet, three, uh, the two boys, My Three Sons, these were all growing families with small children, sort of the JFK family in miniature. The age of the automobile produced its own society. The first drive-in restaurants, the first McDonald's restaurant, Saturday evening post showing the family going on vacation and then later returning. Holiday Inn, the Motel Revolution. This heralded a new society that was mobile. We had the first generation where the kids would leave home and a kid from Boston would go to college in Texas or a college in um, um, California would get a used car, could drive home for the holidays to say nothing of the beginning of air travel. And this was going to be taking taken nationwide and internationally. Another signature uh, program of the JFK uh, um, presidency was the Alliance for Progress. Those countries of South America that the United States had for so long invaded, exploited, persecuted, were now being treated with equality where they can live their lives in dignity and freedom. And we propose to, com um, to complete the revolution of the Americas to build a hemisphere where all men can stand in suitable standard and living. And this was one of his most successful uh, activities in spreading the, the good news of the American century to South America and that they had nothing to fear from the United States, that we were a good neighbor, as uh, FDR would have said it. And now finally, what lives on after the tragic associate, uh, assassination of JFK? Probably JFK will go, goes down in history as one of the most beloved, cherished, and tragic uh, presidents but yet the one that just filled the country from um, Atlantic to the Pacific with optimism, with pride in being an American, that our universal values should be spread around the world. And I know um, from having traveled for so long, that should be JFK Airport there, but we see that it was... Um, Airports were named after him. In Paris, we have the Avenue President John F. Kennedy. In Germany, the, the John F. Kennedy Brücke, the bridge. In South America and Brazil, the Avenue, Avenue of President Kennedy. The JFK Center for the Performing Arts in Washington. Once again, every major city has a bridge, a highway, 
uh, a park or something named after Kennedy. It was very, maybe not in the Soviet Union, but I'm sure now in Russia they are also jumping on the Kennedy um, um, bandwagon. So many items are being uh, um, produced. We have the Kennedy Liberty um, uh, coin, 1964, once again, um, to heralding God's trust, stamps in many countries such as Yemen, um, we see books on, the, uh, on uh, JFK such as the man and the myth, questioning very much whether this uh, Kennedy um, memory is a myth or if it is reality, and even films and ties celebrating the memory of Kennedy. Now, finally, the question that must be asked, and which is very much in the news today, is the American century coming to an end? And we have books like Who Stole the American Dream by Hendrick Smith. And uh, the whole idea, if you work hard, you'll get ahead, and even you, too, can become a JFK. Well, on one hand, we see that it is still alive and well when we have an African American in the White House. And as we move towards the upcoming elections, which I'm sure you are all uh, passionately following, we see that we have had recently not only a Mormon, but we have a woman, another African American, many Hispanics, as well as the true and blue blooded Bushes running for the American presidency very much in line with the American century. But then on the other hand, if we look at the poll here, we see um, that fewer and fewer Americans are questioning whether the uh, American dream myth is still viable. Many people will say that the middle class is disappearing, that the ultra wealthy are controlling more and more of the money, that those at the bottom of the social pyramid see less and less chance of advancement. Many people will argue that China is the up-and-coming power, that soon it will have the largest economy with a very different way of looking at success and at wealth. So this is really um, a major question which we see so, so being so debated in the current presidential elections. And the, uh, slogans like, let's make America great again, which means the American dream came to an end, and now we are trying to restore it or to return to the JFK era or to the American century. So this is really very much in the news today, in the presidency, and in the uh, current elections. So, as you all know, today is the election day. So I hope that you are following all of the events in the news and you will seriously watch the election debates and see so many of the themes which I've mentioned today are being reflected in the political campaign. So. Thank you very much, and I guess now we are going to move on to questions. So, yes, Mark, yes. Do you have a question for me? Can you hear me, Armand? Can you hear me, Armand? Okay. Um, East Northport, do you have a question for me? Yes, I'm, we're wondering, uh, JFK, the way he was viewed uh, back in the heyday versus today in light of all the different, uh, let's see, the, the political uh, views of people, how they change regarding their personal lives and how now that seems to be less, less of an issue. Um, they're just wondering if that's something that now carries over into the new election. Are people more forgiving of, of some of the, uh, the areas where he may not have been the best president? 
Uh, yes, good question. Well, you know, that is, uh, historians really are debating on the presidency of JFK for the simple reason that, don't forget, he, his presidency was really quite short. And he launched a lot of it, uh, programs, such as in civil rights and that, which were luckily taken up by um, uh, later presidents. So a lot of the things which he carried out, uh, his programs, uh, w did become fruitful. But issues like the Vietnam War. Now, at the time, uh, it was not thought that the Vietnam War would become such a tragic uh, issue. And it's very often uh, uh, people question, would John F. Kennedy have let the war get so out of control as future presidents did? Because we see he was very effective in dealing with the Berlin Missile Crisis, uh, or the Berlin Crisis and the Cuban Missile Crisis. He showed that he was successful and he was able to handle these. Uh, if he had continued as president into a first or second term, would he have been able to defuse the Vietnam War? Many people say yes, other people say no. And so he, his career is so much shrouded in myth and mystery, love of the young man, the grieving widow, the kids. So it's very difficult to separate the myth from the reality. And, um, but I think that he even in his assassination and for all of his weaknesses, um, he did leave his mark on American society, that people do look at to his presidency as a time of great promise, great optimism, when people were still proud to be an American and were convinced that the American dream would eventually bring in African Americans and um, everybody uh, else who was not part of the American dream, that it was a time of universal growing education and prosperity. So I think that he still goes down as a very positive figure because of that, um, and also partially because of what he accomplished, uh, but um, but his weaknesses are, are well known. So he's still a controversial um, person, but I don't think he'll be as controversial as, say, George Bush in the uh, Iraq War. I mean, and many people say that we have lost the golden age of Kennedy, and now we are wallowing in uh, decline. And that, that you see very much reflected in the current election. Okay, Lake Grove, do you have a question for me? Lake Grove, are you there? Lynbrook, uh, do you have a question for me? No questions. Okay, thank you. Master Piqua, do you have a question for me? Hello. Uh, we actually have one statement and a question. Uh, President George was mentioning that he believes it was in the early 1940s that America had already been rising to a place of global eminence in terms of uh, attitudes and knowledge. And that was pre-Kennedy, and Kennedy rode that wave into his own greatness. Um, our question comes from Monina who wanted to know, in your estimation, what was the greatest gift of JFK to our country? I would say optimism. That the United States, um, as you said in your comment, um, Kennedy was heir to a growing uh, sense of optimism, of positivism. The United States emerging in World War II as um, a major world power, and then after World War II, culminating in the United States as being the world's first superpower. And John F. Kennedy uh, inherited all of that, uh, and he took it into the White House and made it official government policy. And he believed that all of this was going to continue into the future, unlimited prosperity, 
space exploration, massive new housing developments, uh, mobility of airlines, uh, of highways, that everybody would be able to go to college. And so that spirit is still with us. And I think even today when, uh, especially in, as a college teacher, I know people are complaining about the price of college, is it worthwhile? But for people today, still, education is the key to success. I mean, the high school dropout, clearly, and every indicator, is not going to um, rise to the top unless he or she is extremely uh, gifted. But it is that sense of optimism that is still here today. And even we see that uh, in, s in political slogans like, let's make America great again. Behind that, you see they're going back to this great vision of, uh, of JFK, that uh, we can be great again. And even in the rivalry with China, with China on the verge of becoming uh, the number one economy, Americans still revert back to uh, the belief that our political system, our freedom of the press, our freedom of speech, our separation of church and state, in spite of all of its weaknesses and problems, still makes us um, different. It makes us a positive role model that people should be following. And so I think that um, uh, it is that sense of optimism that we can do it. So even the audacity of hope of, of Obama and all the political slogans, we see how much they reflect those golden years of the um, post-war uh, era. North Hills, do you have a question for me? question. Um, we would like to know what your theory is on why I could you repeat the question? I think we lost you there for a minute. Okay. Okay, North Hills, we'll try to come back to you in a minute. We seem to have lost the connection. North Woodmere, are you there? Yes, we're here. Do you have a, have question? a question? Yes, from Nettie. Did, did they ever discover the background of his assassin? Did they ever discover the background of his assassin? Oh, did they ever oh, discover the background of his assassination? Well, here again, uh, this is also um, myth and every kind of other story comes into it. There's a theory that it was the mafia because Kennedy wanted to uh, declare war against the mafia. Some people say it's the communists. Uh, we really don't know. But um, it, it seems that there, as far as we know now, there was no great plot that it was very much a... Um, a lone gunman, but it is believed that he had some connections with um, uh, the Soviet Union at the time. And so uh, I think there's still a lot of controversy on the topic. Now, the problem with assassinations of any kind or uh, even terrorism is that if you start investigating it, are you going to take steps? For example, with September 11, I mean, it was not listed, it was not presented as a lone gunman, but it was a plot by Al-Qaeda and the United States took the necessary measures. But in the case of Kennedy, the documents are sealed. We know very little of what actually happened, and this is such a an issue that nobody really wants to open the box, although I myself am an intrigued about what happened, but it very much becomes cons uh, mired in conspiracy theories and everybody coming up with all kinds of ideas. But it seems at the present time, uh, because with, in spite of the lack of documents and everything, that it was not a great plot by a major power or any group, but it was much more just the act of a, an individual or a very tiny group of individuals.
Uh, North Hills, are you there? No questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. Sayville, do you have any questions for me? No questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. Westbury, are you there? Yes, we are. No questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. Woodcliffe Lake, uh, do you have any questions for me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. This is Elizabeth at East Meadow. We have a question. Uh, we wanted to know if you have any um, thoughts on JFK being known as a womanizer. I think that is well documented and it is well known. Um, but here again at, uh, you know, in this day and age, things like that would come up, especially with the Monica Lewinsky and all these scandals. People like them. But back in the early 60s, uh, I think the press had a lot less freedom. And it was such an era of optimism and positive, positive attitudes and family values that things like that simply were not mentioned and they were not brought out as major scandals. Today, if uh, Kennedy would have been, uh, would be alive and would be doing the same thing, you can be sure that every scandal would be brought to the news because the news has a very different approach to it. But back in the early 60s, uh, the press did, was not really um, uh, planting microphones in bedrooms and following presidents uh, like they are today. It was just not proper to do it and such things were rarely uh, talked about. White Plains, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. We have a question from Stuart. Yes. Yeah, hello. One thing that's never mentioned about JFK's years as presidency is his relationship with Israel. And I know Israel has a, a custom they'll put up a monument or, or, or in a museum or building's name for any of their friends from the rest of the world. Like there's a Truman Culture Center where operas and concerts are played. And I know after JFK was assassinated, Israel did put up a monument showing appreciation for what he'd done for Israel, and yet it's never mentioned in the history books. And the only thing that's ever mentioned he, is he once hugged Golda Meir at the UN, symbolizing friendship between the two countries. And I feel that that should be mentioned, that he was a good friend of Israel. It's never mentioned. That's an excellent point, yes. Um, and, is, uh, and during his uh, presidency, Israel was, was in a crucial state. Remember, this is before the 67 war when Israel uh, took over the Sinai, East Jerusalem, West Bank, and, uh, um, and the Golan Heights. Israel was a tiny, tiny country, financially on the verge of ruin, and Kennedy did funnel a lot of money in there and valued Israel at the time as being a democratic state. Uh, so you're absolutely right that um, this, uh, uh, his foreign policy um, should make mention of that. You're absolutely right. Okay, thank you everybody.